Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. As we've seen over the past couple of years, language models can generate human-like text, but can they generate factually accurate text? Turns out it's actually pretty hard to do that, but DeepMind and OpenAI recently came out with some interesting approaches to integrate fact-checking into large language models. If you're new here, I'm Jordan, and consider subscribing if you want to hear more about the latest news in AI and machine learning. And you can check out last week's video on the DeepMind Retro and Gopher models, their new language models, if you want a more in-depth explanation of what they're showing. All right, so obviously language models can can't lie because that would imply that they have a will of their own and are intentionally choosing to mislead us. But when it comes down to it, the text that we're optimizing language models to generate isn't optimized to be factually correct, it's optimized to look like the data that it is trained on. Most of these data sets aren't collected based on the factual accuracy of the content. So we're looking at places like Wikipedia, Reddit, general web scraping of human written text, places where you can find a lot of examples of text that is realistic, that looks like something that a human would write because a human did write it, but not necessarily text that is correct. And even if you look at data sets that come from places like books, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are accurate in terms of the text. Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep is a great example of a book that falls into this category because it was pretty thoroughly debunked by a random guy in Russia. Also, as a fun fact, uh, publishers don't generally fact check nonfiction books. If you're a nonfiction author, you can like hire somebody to do that for you, but there's a surprising amount of uh, not truth that can get into nonfiction books without any sort of pushback from a publisher, which I always find interesting. So on top of the fact that data sets from large language models aren't necessarily collected based on the factual accuracy of the content, there's also just the fact that accurate is a kind of nebulous term. Obviously there are certain things in the world, in life, that are true, that we've accepted as true, that we take to be true, and there are certain things that we have accepted as false. But there's also a lot of information where you might not know the answer, there might not be a clear answer, and so developing language models and developing language model data sets that capture that and that allow that to be conveyed through the text that the model generates is a pretty challenging problem. I mean, that's something that's hard enough for people to actually convey through text. So there are a few data sets that aim to essentially test how well language models generate factually accurate or truthful statements, truthful text. One of them is a data set called Truthful QA, which I'll pull up here. Generally, language models get around 50% of these correct as compared to humans getting closer to 90% of them correct. So we clearly still have a ways to go. And another one that is often used when it comes to having models answer questions accurately is the ELI-5, the Explain It Like I'm 5 dataset, which is comprised of essentially questions and answers that are pulled off of the ELI-5 subreddit. But in terms of the models themselves, DeepMind and OpenAI recently published on two interesting approaches to integrate fact-checking into models. One of them is DeepMind's Retro, which we talked about in last week's video, so if you want a much more detailed dive into that model, you can check that out. Essentially what Retro does is create a database of text that the model has been trained on so that when a model generates some sort of text based on a prompt, it can cross-check based on the database to see whether or not it is, you know, accurate based on the information that it has, whether or not it lines up with the information that it has, and adjust the generated text based on that. In theory, this means that the model can generate more accurate text. However, it does depend on essentially you curating that data set to make sure that the text that is in it is accurate or as accurate as it can be or allows for some manner of conveying that information is unclear or unknown to the person who is reading the text that the model is generating. Another issue with it is that when we have text that's generated by a model, first of all, you might not actually know that you're reading text that's been generated by not a human, and second of all, you don't necessarily know what the sources of information that the model is pulling from are. So even in the case of something like Retro, there's no citations in this model to tell you here are the different sources that we cross-checked from and this is where this information is derived from. Because at the end of the day, when you're training large language models, 
all of the generative text is based on existing text in the world somewhere, and in theory you should be able to trace back the source of it, and with Retro you pretty explicitly can. OpenAI's new model, WebGP3, actually aims to address that issue in a pretty interesting way. So what they did was create a GPT-3 model that connects their model to a web search on the internet and then inherently optimizes for truthfulness so that the model can search for accurate answers and then use that information to construct an answer to a question and include the citations of where they got the information that they used to construct the answer in the actual response. I do have to note that it's hilarious to me that the uh, web browser that they connected it to is Microsoft Bing because I can only imagine that the only reason that you use Bing is because you have a long-term partnership with Microsoft, but I just find that funny. In testing this model, they looked at both the ELI-5, the Explain It Like I'm 5 dataset, as well as the Truthful QA dataset, and importantly, they also had humans come up with answers to the ELI-5 questions in order to essentially account for any errors or discrepancies in how people essentially convey their reference answers on Reddit. In that case, the model performed comparably, if not slightly better than the human responses in terms of generating accurate responses and generally better than the reference answers on the ALI5 dataset. They also tested it on the Truthful QA dataset and found that the WebGPT performs definitely better than GPT-3, but significantly worse than humans do, so we still have a decent way to go on that front. They also talk about the fact that when it comes to answering questions like these in both models, there's often times that a model will generate something that's kind of obviously wrong and those are easier to catch, but there are times that models generate things that it actually takes human beings a while to kind of parse as wrong, and so that's going to be an ongoing challenge in continuing to incorporate fact-checking into these models because at the end of the day when we evaluate whether or not something is true, we're usually using human beings to do that, and if a human can't necessarily easily identify that, then that becomes an additional challenge on top of everything else. And even with these improvements in fact-checking performance, it's also important to note that in a lot of cases, people don't necessarily know that they're interacting with a language model when they're reading text, and making sure that people do know when that's happening is a great way to essentially adjust their perception of the text and incorporate critical thinking skills into how seriously or how truthfully they take it. Which, as an aside, is also why I think that having accessible model cards for models and datasets is definitely a good idea because they're relatively easy for people to parse and can give people some insight into what they should be aware of in terms of the pros and cons of the models that they're interacting with, but that could be a whole other video. But in short, as you can see, if you're interested in developing systems to fact-check language models, there are plenty of opportunities to get involved. And if you're new to machine learning or you don't necessarily know where to start, Brilliant's newly updated courses on scientific thinking and logic are a great place to get started. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it's a website and app based on the principle of active problem solving. In fact, if you're like me and you haven't ordered your holiday gifts yet, even though it is the weekend before Christmas, a year of STEM learning on Brilliant makes a great gift for anyone from an inquisitive niece to an all-knowing parent or to the neighbor who seems to have everything. In fact, Brilliant recently updated a bunch of their courses to be even more interactive, which I really appreciate as someone who learns better through visual and physical intuition than through rote memorization. For example, their brand new logic course is packed with opportunities for hands-on problem solving, and exercises like this one will open up your mind and help you look at problems in a completely new way. Brilliant makes an awesome gift for any of the ambitious learners in your life. So hurry, the first 200 of you to go to the link in the description will get 20% off a year of STEM learning on Brilliant for yourself or for someone else. Otherwise, as I mentioned, if you want to check out my video on DeepMind's Gopher and Retro Models from last week, I'll link it over here. You can follow me on all my various socials down below, and I will see you all next week. Bye!